in this video we are going to talk about measurement this time okay tools we use for measuring and other important points that we need to be aware of or remind ourselves from the very beginning from the start all right so we'll start off by looking at some tools equipment apparatus we can call them different names which are used for measuring three of our main physical quantities length time and mass First, we have length or distance, and there are many different types of equipment that we can use to measure length. Probably the most common is the ruler. Traditionally, in our labs, we find the meter ruler, which is just a ruler which is specifically one meter long, although we can use other smaller rulers, such as the ones that we have in our pencil cases and that you use for your homeworks. Apart from the rulers, we can also use measuring tapes to measure lengths and as you can see from the picture there are different types of measuring tapes. When we need to measure smaller lengths, the measuring tapes and the rulers might not be accurate enough and so we need other apparatus. One of these is the vernier calipers, which you can see over there and which we can find in analog or also in digital form and for even smaller lengths we use a micrometer screw gauge okay which is again can be found in analog and digital and this is used to measure very small distances for example the thickness of a particular wire okay the next physical quantity that we need to measure is time and there are different pieces of equipment which we can use to measure time for instance the hourglass and the sundial help us to measure time and as they are not very accurate for what we usually need in our work so the traditional piece of the equipment which we will use to measure time is the stopwatch as you can see from the picture stopwatches can be analog or digital they can be handheld like the ones that you're seeing over there or we can also use a variety of stopwatches that we find them on our wristwatches, smartphones, tablets, computers, etc. Okay? If we want even more precise timings, then we need to opt for an electronic timer, which is more accurate, it is a very accurate piece of equipment, uh, which starts and stops electronically, rather than depending on us pressing buttons or clicking somewhere. The next physical quantity that we need to measure is mass and once again there are many different pieces of, of equipment that we can use to measure the mass of something. Starting off with a simple bathroom scales okay, which we use to measure our own mass or else we can go into something like this a scale pen or a top pen balance where we need to balance the left and right hand sides you would put known masses on one side and on the other side you place the items that you are measuring until the two sides balance out and are perfectly in equilibrium. Another type is the balance we find in the kitchen such as this which is an analog version. In our case we will mainly use digital versions such as these. Okay, And these are um, our electronic balances which are the most common type of balance we use to measure mass in most of our experiments. Now apart from what we just mentioned we also need to look into measuring volume as this is also an important physical quantity that we will meet throughout our studies. And when it comes to volume we consider two different types when we consider measurement of volume of this. Okay, we consider measuring regular shaped objects and irregular shaped objects. Let's start with regular ones. In regular shaped objects, to find the volume of the shape, we just need to use METs. We need to use some mathematical formula. So yes, some METs does come into physics, 
okay so at times you need to brush up some ideas from maths when necessary for instance let's look at some simple examples we can have objects which are in the shape of a cube or a cuboid and to find the volume what do we use we use volume equals length times breadth times height we can have objects which are in the shape of a cylinder and so we need the volume of a cylinder which is pi r squared h we can also have objects which are in the shape of a sphere and once again we need the volume of a sphere which is 4 thirds pi r cubed or we can even have shapes which are in the form of a cone and once again we need to find the volume which is 1 third pi r squared h and so on okay so once again make sure to revise this formula from your maths as you may need them throughout some questions in physics what if we need to find the volume of a, an object which is not regular which is irregular for instance suppose we need to find the volume of a stone look at a stone i'm sure you've seen stones look how irregular their shapes are or what about a figurine or even a toy soldier it is much harder to use mathematics to find the volumes of these shapes so instead of maths we find their volumes through experimentation you can still use this method of experimentation to find volume of regular shaped objects such as the cube the sphere etc but it is usually easier and quicker to work with maths in those cases To be able to find the volume of an irregular shaped object, we need equipment which can measure volume of liquid. And for the same in our laboratories, we usually find equipment like measuring cylinders, beakers, syringes, etc. which are all graded on purpose to help us measure the volume of a liquid. Now when we are measuring volumes, there is one thing that we have to be extra careful for because of accuracy and this is what is called the meniscus you see the word written in front of you have a look at this as an example notice the black line near the 20 mark the mark is in fact not a perfect straight line but it is slightly curved downwards can you see that let's zoom in a bit more now this happens okay you can see with the zoomed part you can see a bit more this curve and this happens because of the adhesion adhesion is when things stick together of the adhesion of the liquid molecules with the molecules of the container right that is why because the, the molecules of the liquid tend to stick with the container and the way they stick creates that curve pattern which we call the meniscus that curve is called the meniscus now what is most relevant for us is that in a case like this we must always read the value at the bottom of the meniscus and not at the top All right now this is very important because in exams you are given these questions at times and if you don't read it correctly you will get it wrong in experiments you will lose you will lose your accuracy also so in this case the bottom of the meniscus is exactly within the 20 the 20 um, mark while the top part reaches another 0.2 of whatever unit is being measured okay so here the correct value will be of 20 and nothing more okay in fact we have two types of meniscus as you can see here in this picture with water and other liquids we meet we normally have what is called a concave meniscus it is the one that is shown in blue and it is curved downwards you can see the curve is uh, tending downwards okay now an exception to this is in fact mercury right which in uh, in later topics we will meet 
Mercury is in fact it is a metal but it is a liquid metal and the molecules have a strong attraction to each other in fact their attraction to each other is stronger than the attraction with the container and this results in the opposite shape as you can see with the gray part the the shape of the curve is going up and this is another type of meniscus all right now although in many examples we have we will probably be drawing straight lines to represent liquid levels you should be we well aware of this property for accuracy when you are asked to draw a tube or a flask with liquid you should show the meniscus and also when you are reading values from questions which may be given or even from your experiments remember that you should always read from the bottom of the meniscus in the case of the blue one the concave one or from the top of the meniscus in the case of the convex one okay this is an important precaution in your experiments and this is an important procedure for accuracy and for getting your results correct Now, suppose we need to find the volume of a stone, which is completely irregular, like the one over there. What do we need? We need the stone, and we need a measuring cylinder, a beaker, or some other form of container which has volume markings on it. First step is to fill the measuring cylinder with water up to a certain level, and we record this value. For example, here, we have 20 centimeters cubed, so we filled it up, we filled our measuring cylinder up to the 20 centimeter cube mark. Okay, note that to keep this explanation simple, we've, we represented the water level as a straight line and not with the meniscus, but keep in mind what we had mentioned before on the meniscus. In the next step, we gently lower the stone inside the measuring cylinder. And what will happen? The water level is going to increase. So we record the new value, which in this case is of 30 centimeters cubed. Once we have the two readings, to find the volume of the stone, all we have to do is subtract them. Right? So volume of stone is equal to the final reading minus the initial reading. So in this case, what do we have? We have 30 minus 20 centimeters cubed, and that will give us an, a volume of 10 centimeters cubed. All right, so the volume of the stone was of 10 centimeters cubed. In fact, here we are noting that the volume of the object is equal to the volume of the water which is being displaced, which is being shifted, if you like. As a small side note for this experiment, most of the times when you have something like a stone for example we tie it with a small string first of all it means it helps us to lower it gently without splashing and secondly it helps us also to take it out without making a mess in the water but what if we need to find the volume of an irregular object which floats for example wood Jablo, plastic, these float. Over here in the picture we're seeing a piece of wood, a piece of a branch or a twig, something. How can we find its volume? Uh, since it floats, the water level will not rise if we place it in the water. Do you have any ideas? Well, in fact, in this case, we need to use what is called a sinker. A sinker is nothing more than a heavy object which sinks and we tie our wood, our plastic, whatever it is, to the sinker so that it pulls it down with it. For instance, here in this example, we are using a stone as a sinker. So first we record the water level with the stone in the cylinder, as we described before. And then we tie the wood to the stone and lower them back down gently inside the measuring cylinder. We read the value of the water level, and in this case, we can see that it is giving us a value of 36 centimeters cubed. So, if our previous reading with the stone was 30, this means that the volume of the wood is 
6 cm cubed. A final note in the section on volume is that it could be that you come across a special piece of equipment of apparatus which is called a displacement can. As you can see in this picture, a displacement can is like a beaker or a flask or a cylinder, but it has a nozzle in the side of it. So what happens here? We fill it up with water up to the level of the no nozzle, exactly up to the level of the nozzle. If you were to put anything inside of the displacement can, what will happen? The water will rise and will fall down the nozzle. And in fact, that is how we do this experiment of measuring the volume. All right. Um, we have our displacement can initially with the measuring cylinder at the bottom, which is empty. And then we lower the stone gently inside the displacement can. And the water which overflows is collected inside the measuring cylinder or beaker or whatever. And we simply read the volume of the water which is collected. We don't need to do any subtraction here. We just measure and read the volume of the water which is collected over there. In the final part of this video, we will mention some errors and precautions that we should keep in mind when performing measurements, and especially in our experiments. It is also very common to be asked for such precautions in the exams, so make sure that you keep this in mind, okay, and um, you remember them and you refresh. There are many more than the ones we are going to mention. Okay, so it is a good idea, very good practice to keep a list of these as you go along in your studies. The first point we mention is that of repeated readings. For accuracy, we repeat measurements a number of times and then we take the average. We don't rely only on one measurement because it is more accurate to do it this way. Okay, it ensures that if we had a mistake with one of our readings, the effect of the mistake would be kept to a minimum. It is the most common in terms of an approach in our work to take three readings in experiments, but this may vary depending on the measurement which is needed and the experiment which is being carried out. Okay, so repeated readings, remember. Next, we've already mentioned the use of stopwatches for measuring time and in fact an important source of error here is what is called human reaction time. This is the time it takes for us to actually press the button on the watch to start or stop your timing. Of course this is a very small amount of time that we're talking about, normally we would be talking about something in the order of milliseconds for example, but in certain experiments this may be crucial. Hence, sometimes we need to be more precise. Okay, and remember that a more precise method of measurement is to use electronic timers. An important precaution when measuring liquids, which we have already mentioned, is to keep in mind the meniscus and read from the bottom or the top, depending on which one you have. We've also mentioned how important it is to lower objects in liquids gently so that we do not splash and in fact this is an important precaution which you should mention and keep in mind. Remember or try and figure out if you like that on splashing the original amount of water you had would now be less. For instance suppose you had 100 centimeters cubed of water originally and then you throw the stone inside the tube. What will happen? the water will splash out and the original amount would have decreased. For example, it became 95 centimeters cubed. And so here you're going to have a lack of accuracy with your workings because the value actually changed. And either you're going to work inaccurate or you have to restart your experiment. Another precaution is to avoid end errors. Suppose we need to measure the length of the pencil inside in the diagram, right? 
Um, if we just put the pencil randomly with our ruler, as we are doing over there, we can in fact note its length, but we risk of doing a mistake. For example, a common unfortunate mistake which some students do is that in this case, they say that the pencil is eight and a half milli centimeters, because those are centimeters, eight and a half centimeters long. It is not eight and a half centimeters long because why? Because it is not starting from the zero. If we start measuring from the zero mark, our measurements can be more precise. In this case, the pencil is six centimeters long. All right, so as much as possible, we should always reset our scales or measuring equipment and start reading measurements always from zero. This applies to something like this where we are reading from a ruler. If you are using some form of an electronic balance to measure the mass, make sure that it is starting from zero and not from some other value. Okay, so this is an important point. Finally, a last precaution that we mentioned is to avoid what are called parallax errors. Now these errors occur when we do not read measurements at eye level. For example, consider the, the numbers and the example you're seeing in front of you over there. The blue is the correct reading while the ones in red are incorrect. Now, when reading the measurement of a ruler, my eye has to be directly above the ruler. If I am reading at some angle, I will get an incorrect reading. For example, here, the correct reading is 5 cm. But if I am reading it slightly to an angle, one side or the other, I will read a measurement which is either slightly below or slightly above the 5 cm. As you can see, there are 5.1 and 4.9 cm, which are both incorrect. Likewise, if I am taking readings of a measuring cylinder, for example, I need to make sure that I am reading at eye level with the liquid surface and not from higher up. Okay, so sometimes we need to make sure that we are reading in the correct positions. Otherwise, we are going to lose on our accuracy. Well, that's it for this lesson. In this video, as a quick recap, we had an idea of the main apparatus which are used for measurement, especially with regards to length, time and mass. There are more tools and equipment that we shall meet along the way. Okay, here we just mentioned very basic ones. Um, so it's always good to note the different types of equipment that we will meet. For example, we'll mention spring balance, we'll mention lenses, we'll mention emitters, etc. We also discussed in some detail measuring volumes, both regular and irregular objects. And finally, we also looked at some common errors and precautions that we need to be aware of. Alright, so that's it for today. I hope that you like this video and thank you for watching.